working. Good afternoon, everyone, on this beautiful fall afternoon. I get it we're going to head, head into winter tomorrow, but at least uh, we're going to be in good shape for it today. Can't hear. Can you hear now? A little bit. Gee whiz. Hmm. Hello. Is that better? I think I just turned it on. Sorry. I'm not very technical. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Ken Yalowitz. I'm the director of the uh, Dickey Center for International Understanding here at Dartmouth. And I'm very, very pleased to welcome you to a, a very special event today. Um, my wife and I had the pleasure last summer, uh, I was a lecturer on a, a Dartmouth alumni trip cruise. And one of the subjects that I chose to speak on was uh, European unification and uh, the, Uni the United States' attitudes towards uh, the same. Uh, the trip coincided with the uh, constitutional vote on the European Union Constitution uh, in France and the Netherlands, and I found I had to pretty much junk you know, what I had prepared and, and go back to the drawing board. Um, but the key point uh, out of all of that, again, is that despite um, all of our attention on the Middle East, on Iraq, uh, on quote unquote the war on terrorism, the process of European unification, the process of Europe becoming Europe uh, is going on and it doesn't get a great deal of attention uh, in our press and I think and in our public discussion. Uh, there's a lot of debate about the process of European unification. Some believe that um, with the economic might of the European Union, uh, that it's on the verge of becoming uh, a superpower. Uh, there are others, uh, some of the neoconservatives in this country, who look at uh, the smallish European defense budgets, uh, who look at uh, the opposition from France and Germany to the war in Iraq, uh, and who basically look at Europe as, as weak, as, as focused uh, more on enhancing their style of living uh, rather than dealing with crucial issues of the day. But the bottom line uh, is that, um, you know, and certainly since World War II, the United States-European relationship, you know, is a critical one. And how we deal with Europe, how we engage the Europeans uh, is a very, very important part, not only of our diplomacy, but how we engage uh, the world as a whole. And we're really fortunate today to have um, a speaker who will address these issues and talk about uh, the United States uh, in the world and the relationship uh, with the Europeans. And for me, uh, it's always a pleasure uh, to welcome a former ambassador, uh, you know, a fellow uh, foreign service officer uh, from the Department of State, uh, Ambassador uh, Montegal Stearns, Monty Stearns. Monty is one of our most distinguished and well-respected uh, ambassadors. Uh, unfortunately, we never had the opportunity to serve together, uh, but I certainly knew of him, and uh, he is very, very well thought of and very highly regarded uh, from within the Foreign Service and without. He served as the United States Ambassador to Greece uh, from August of 1981 through September of 1985. Uh, he, as a career Foreign Service officer, also served as the United States Ambassador to the Republic of Ivory Coast from 1976 through 79, and he was also Vice President of the National Defense University from 1979 through 1981. His other Foreign Service postings included Turkey, the Congo, the United Kingdom, and Laos. And amongst his Washington assignments, he served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs and as Special Assistant to W. Averill Harriman, then the State Department's Ambassador at Large. He left the Foreign Service, retired in 1987, and has been uh, a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C., 
Uh, he's been the Warburg Professor of International Relations at Simmons College in Boston, <clears throat> the Whitney H. Shepardson Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York, an associate and affiliate of the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs at Harvard University, and the Stanley J. Seeger Visiting Research Fellow at Princeton University. He's also uh, the author of several books, uh, and to me is the uh, epitome of, of the scholar uh, diplomat, uh, the practitioner and the academic, which I think is a wonderful, wonderful combination. So please welcome uh, me and joining Ambassador Montego Stearns. Monty. Thanks, Ken. Ladies and gentlemen, my wife Tony and I are delighted to be here. The last time we were in Hanover was in December, and I can't believe how rapidly global warming has changed, <laughs> changed the atmosphere. It's been a wonderful day for, for us, and we enjoy it thoroughly. My first uh, foreign post uh, as a young diplomat was Ankara, Turkey. And uh, I arrived in the spring of 1949. I was the most junior of a uh, growing staff. This was immediately uh, after the proclamation of the, of the Truman Doctrine, and we were building up in both Ankara and uh, Athens our staffs. Uh, I was, uh, my title was Assistant Attaché. Uh, I don't think I've ever met an Assistant Attaché since, so perhaps I retired that particular title, but I was at the very bottom of a diplomatic list that was a long, long totem pole. In any event, a year after I arrived in Ankara, North Korea invaded South Korea. And uh, within uh, a matter of days, I received an unexpected call from the deputy chief of mission at the embassy. And I went over to his office and found him in a nervous state, his face pallid, and uh, he said to me, uh, you know that it is only a matter of time uh, after the Korean War broke out that the Soviet Union is going to invade Turkey. I said, uh, no, sir, I hadn't realized that. He said, yes, those of us who uh, uh, know Soviet policies uh, realize that it is only a matter of time, and uh, the ambassador is making preparations for a small group of Americans to be interned uh, since uh, the Turks will put up a vigorous resistance but will certainly be overwhelmed. And he has asked that you be included in this group. And I was enormously flattered. I just couldn't believe uh, that I had already made such an enormous impact on the Embassy on American Policy and on the Ambassador himself. It was only later that I learned that the Ambassador had made his selection he wanted only people who played golf and bridge. Uh, of course, as we know, uh, the Soviet Union did not invade Turkey. And this is by way of saying that uh, decisions made and policies laid and analyses conducted uh, uh, immediately after catastroph uh, catastrophic events are often wrong. The ambassador and his deputy were wrong about the Soviet Union's intentions to invade Turkey. They were also probably wrong in thinking that had the Soviet Union invaded Turkey, we internees would have been permitted to pay, play golf. Furthermore, my bridge wasn't nearly at his level. I, th I mention this because I think that uh, on a much larger, uh, more dangerous, and more significant scale, uh, what happened to American policy on September 11, 2001, was similar. Uh, in a matter of hours, the Bush administration foreign policy, which had been for humility and against nation building, became a policy that was against humility and for nation building. And there was very little analysis of how American policy should 
really respond beyond military measures after the catastrophe, the tragedy of September 11. To declare war on, on uh, terrorism had a fine resonant sound and made good headlines. But it really, as one examined it, didn't make much sense. It was as though one were to declare war on disease without trying to distinguish between the causes of malaria, typhoid, AIDS, and other diseases. Terrorism is, after all, the expression of a grievance, but it doesn't define the grievance. And the agenda of Palestinian terrorists is different from the agenda of Chechen terrorists and Kashmiri ter terrorists. And military measures are obviously necessary, but I think as we examine, as we live with the situation in Iraq after two years of fighting, we can see that military measures alone are not going to do the job. We'll have to have longer term and more careful, carefully uh, framed policies uh, if we are to remain secure over the course of the next decade. I think if we want to understand what our own agenda should be for the foreseeable future, we have to start with the immediate end of the Cold War and see what was happening to the world. Two uh, trends emerged almost immediately. The first was that states that had been held together by totalitarian regimes, like the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia, began to fall apart. And the second was that transnational problems that had always existed just below the surface of world events uh, swam into our conscience, consciousness. We began to see that uh, global warming and international terrorism and uh, communicable diseases, problems that don't need passports, were problems that we were going to have to spend much more, more time on, take much more seriously than we had uh, in the past. And the immediate result of these two trends was a disposition to say, uh, perhaps diplomacy uh, is not a craft that can deal with problems of this kind. After all, uh, states that fall apart and transnational uh, problems seem to challenge uh, nation-state sovereignty. And diplomats, by definition, are the agents of nation-state sovereignty. But on reflection, one can see that the opposite has happened, that these two trends have created a greater need uh, for diplomatic skill uh, than existed during the Cold War when the world was divided into two blocks or three if one took seriously uh, the notion of a third world. The problems now are far more complicated, require much closer study, much greater expertise uh, than anything we had before. One advantage that we had in the Cold War was that the danger of a nuclear confrontation with the Soviet Union meant that uh, political administrations realized that uh, they needed the advice of people who spoke Russian, who knew uh, the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, people like uh, George Cannon, Chip Bolin, and Tommy Thompson. And this was the only area in the world in which professional diplomatic expertise was taken particularly seriously. And the result was favorable and benign. We saw the uh, influence that Tommy Thompson had during the Cuban Missile Crisis when his ability to say to the XCOM meeting and to the president himself, uh, I don't think this is the way the Soviet leaders are looking at the problem had a real influence on President Kennedy and helped avert what would have been a terrible confrontation and conflagration. But uh, except during that period of the Cold War, diplomatic expertise, regional expertise, knowledge of foreign languages, knowledge of foreign cultures was never taken very seriously by successive 
American administration. And uh, with the end of the Cold War, it has taken a lot of time to realize how, how acute the need uh, has, has become. Even the present administration, which uh, on the whole has been disdainful about diplomacy, has very recently said through Condoleezza Rice, this is the time for diplomacy. Now, this means that uh, when we look at the problem that's most on our minds, which is international terrorism, instead of just a war, it has to be a multidimensional approach. It means that uh, if terrorism is to be contained, it will require more than military means, and more than coalitions of the willing. And the natural allies, those with the deepest sense of what has to be done, are certainly the United States and the Europeans. So that the deterioration of relations between the US and Western Europe has had a dire consequences and is clearly the first of our relations that needs to be repaired. Even as our relations with Western Europe and the European Union improve, we will find that there are differences, fundamental differences in the American and the European approach to diplomacy. The founding fathers of our republic were very conscious that our foreign affairs were going to be different, different uh, qualitatively from traditional European foreign affairs and foreign policies. You remember that Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin uh, made a point of dressing plain colors, <coughs> eschewing any uh, of the plumed uniforms that uh, European diplomats uh, wore. We were going to be different. We were different. That was why we had declared our independence, why we had framed our Constitution. The United States uh, didn't appoint an ambassador to a foreign country until 1891. And the reason was that we associated the title ambassador with courts and kings the first manual of American diplomacy published in the early part of the 19th century, says that uh, an ambassador is not an appropriate representative of the United States because our envoys abroad represent nothing but the nation. For practical reasons, we uh, finally gave in. Incidentally, the Soviets went through the same transition immediately after the October Revolution. There were no Soviet uh, uh, ambassadors or ministers abroad. There were only the people's representatives. But the Soviets uh, discovered, as we had earlier, the people's representatives ended up below the salt and were never received by chiefs of state. So uh, compromises needed to be made. Another difference in the American approach which is still apparent. I think uh, Ken and I could both attest to the fact that uh, this particular mentality still activates much of, our, much of our foreign policy. Americans look at foreign affairs and think in terms of problems to be solved. Europeans look at foreign affairs as a continuing process which Problems can be mitigated, but many of them can never be solved. For uh, an American government, most American governments, no foreign problem is worth paying attention to until it reaches crisis proportions. For most Europeans, uh, a problem that has reached crisis proportions is a problem too long neglected. It was Cardinal Richelieu that said that diplomacy has to be a permanent negotiation in search of semi-permanent uh, treaty arrangements. 
a continuing process, a realization that uh, there are a lot of problems in the world that we simply have to live with, that we're never going to be able to, to solve them as such. This has had an effect uh, on American diplomacy and on American foreign policy, which puts us in the position of an observer of foreign affairs. American foreign policymakers like doctrines, and one reason they like doctrines is that doctrines usually apply only to foreigners. Most states uh, eschew doctrines uh, like the plague, feeling that a doctrine is likely to limit your options in an ever-changing world. After the promulgation of the Truman Doctrine, it was already apparent when the communists took over in China that uh, President Truman's pledge to defend freedom wherever it was threatened was by no means categorical. And when the Johnson administration tried to apply the Truman Doctrine to Vietnam, the results were disastrous. So doctrines are rigid, but they also imply that uh, you're really not engaged in foreign affairs, that you are manipulating uh, foreign affairs from the outside. This is why uh, I titled this talk, uh, Turning Superman into Clark Kent. We hear an awful lot about United States as today's hyperpower, number one in the world. And certainly in military terms and in economic terms, we are unchallengeable. But that's only part of the story. Immediately after World War II, our position was probably more powerful than it is today. We were then producing something like 52% of the world's GDP. It's now down to 25%. And our military strength immediately after World War II was, even with the demobilization that was occurring, formidable. And at that time, uh, being number one wasn't something that we boasted a lot about. It was something that we took for granted and sought to use in a constructive way through the Marshall Plan and through the, through the Truman Doctrine. In the last 20 years, uh, I had the pleasure and privilege of seeing a good deal of George Kennan in his 80s and 90s living in retirement at Princeton. And Kennan used to say, why is it that we have to brag so much? And it's true that, uh, of course, all statesmen, all leaders <coughs> uh, extol their country's virtues nothing to apologize for. But I, like Kennan, sometimes wonder why it's necessary uh, to argue that the United States is the greatest power in the history of the world. I blame a little bit the academic political scientists. It seems to me that the study of history teaches humility and the study of political science uh, teaches overconfidence or cultivates overconfidence. In any event, for whatever reason, we seem to not be willing to use our position as number one by engaging ourselves in the problems of the world, but instead we try to separate ourselves. I think the time has come to join the world, not to relinquish American leadership. That is, that's not a connotation that I would accept or you would accept. But uh, certainly instead of looking at the world from the outside, let's look at it from the inside. Instead of formulating doctrines, let's formulate, formulate pragmatic policies. I think what happened on September 11, 2001 was not, as the president would have it, that the world changed. But I think the United States changed very fundamental way. 
I think September 11 was the end of American exceptionalism. And I think some of the outspoken nationalism that we now have in the United States is simply the U.S. being pulled kicking and screaming into a world that other countries have been living in for a very long time. As terrible as September 11 was, it certainly wasn't the beginning of terrorism. The British have been living with terrorism, the French have been living with terrorism, and we have much to learn from the way they handled these problems. So that if it is, in fact, time to enter the rest of the world, that means that uh, Clark Kent is going to be a more valuable citizen of the world than Superman could ever be. It's exciting to, uh, to leap over tall buildings in a single bound. But uh, by doing so, you often can't see the problems that are developing in the basement, where in my experience, most problems begin. I think we need uh, a larger and better informed foreign service. I, need we, I think we need a much closer uh, relationship between professional uh, diplomats and uh, political policy makers. And I think that we need, most of all, a concentrated and a genuine effort, not a rhetorical effort, to improve our relations with the European Union. There are those, particularly some of the neocons, who gloat over the fact that French and Dutch have rejected the EU Constitution, but the EU Constitution and the EU are not one and the same. The EU has, uh, before the votes this spring, been operating in a variegated way with various levels of cooperation. And this will continue. We are certainly closer in terms of our values, our outlook, our perspective on the world with the uh, Europeans than with any other part of the world. And if we are to develop the kinds of policies that not only contain terrorism militarily, but begin to find the sources and adjust our own behavior constructively to remove some of the elements and provocations that make terrorism such a savage weapon, uh, we're going to have to live with insecurity for a very long time to come. So that despite the differences in our own approach to foreign affairs and our own approach to diplomacy, Europe and the United States are bound by destiny to work closely, closely together. And forget the Constitution and those negative votes. There is a genuine desire in Western Europe to create a significant and effective role in world affairs because the individual nations of Western Europe have played that kind of a role in the past. But it isn't simply to serve as a counterweight or a challenge to American power, although American power certainly reinforces the desire of the Western Europeans to manage their own affairs and to defend themselves. But we're going to have to uh, be willing to make the kinds of compromises that in the last decade we have been very unwilling to make. This was true uh, of the Clinton administration as it is more abundantly and visibly true of the Bush administration. So let's accept the fact that American leadership is going to be important in the world for a long time to come, whether it's in terms of economic development or, or defeating terrorism, but that it's not something we can do alone. It's not something we can do by rhetoric and doctrines. It's only something that we can do in close cooperation with the rest of the world particularly with Western Europe. Thanks very much. I'll be interested in your comments and questions.
Does anyone think that uh, the European Union itself is doomed after the defeat of the Constitution in May? Is there a future for uh, Europe as a collaborative link? How do you think that we can best step-by-step step improve our relations with Western Europe? Is it uh, simply a matter of uh, uh, the President or the Secretary of State making uh, trips and uh, having press conferences, or are there specific uh, steps that we could take which would encourage Europeans to work more closely with us in Iraq, for example? One that I can think of would be uh, to share some of the wealth that is now going to Kellogg, Brown, and Root, and to Halliburton, and to American companies. Some of this uh, will have to be shared to make it worthwhile in a pragmatic sense for the Europeans to take the risks uh, that will be involved if they are to play a more active role. Turkey, Turkey is yeah, this is obviously going to be a, a very long process, but I, like uh, most others that I know, uh, we're happy to, to see that uh, the Union, after all of the Austrian objections, has agreed to start talks. Seems to be only valuable for the Union, for the rest of us, to hold out the possibility of Turkey becoming a full member. There's just the prospect of membership and candidacy has uh, had significant uh, effects internally, as you know, on Turkey. Incidentally, uh, the uh, Prime Minister, uh, the President of Turkey, uh, Mr. Erdogan, uh, is depicted often as an Islamicist who doesn't accept the basic reforms instituted by Mustafa Kemal. But uh, in practice, he has three uh, children. Uh, one, his son uh, is a graduate of the University of Indiana and was at the Kennedy School last year, and his two daughters are now attending the University of Indiana. So that even uh, a non-Kemalist like Erdogan is Western-oriented in important ways. And I think the uh, Turkish leadership is realistic enough to know that uh, uh, 10 years is going to be needed at minimum to uh, hurdle, uh, to for Turkey to reach the convergence criteria, not only economically, but culturally. But the very process, it seems to me, is well worthwhile. I should add that I had a lot of doubts about the rapidity of the EU expansion as I did about NATO expansion. It seemed to me that before expanding, both of those organizations should have, should have agreed or attempted to agree on new mission. And I think what we've seen is a dilution of both NATO and uh, and uh, the EU's ability to uh, take decisive steps. But the EU itself was already making an important peacekeeping contribution in Afghanistan, in Kosovo, in Bosnia, and so forth. So that uh, it's playing a role which uh, it's in our interest to increase. And as far as Turkey is concerned, I'm very happy that the Greek government decided that uh, they could at least, uh, for the record, support Turkish membership in the EU. Any of the other larger EU countries were hiding behind Greek objection. It was only when Greece uh, supported supported Turkish membership or candidacy, the real issues began to come out. But it will take time. Yes. And uh, in this conference uh, for visas, there were uh, people. There were people from Moscow, from uh, Belgrade, from Turkey, and uh, all of them said to me, with passion, "You are the most hated nation in the world." And they expanded on the reasons which we know. Um, I, I hope some people realize that in 
Peter, I couldn't agree with you more. But I think some of this is a matter of style, and the Bush administration style, which is hard for many Americans to take, is certainly uh, impossible for most Europeans to take. I looked at uh, a poll results <clears throat> last summer, and even in Turkey, uh, over 50 percent of those polled thought that the United States was a greater threat to world peace than Iraq. And uh, of course, as you move into Western Europe, uh, the percentages even become greater, and even those countries like uh, Britain and Italy, which supported the U.S. Uh, war in Iraq, uh, the poll numbers were frighteningly unfavorable uh, for the Americans. To some extent, uh, I think we used to uh, place too much importance on being liked. Uh, uh, and to that extent, uh, what is liked and disliked about the United States changes fairly rapidly when administrations change and when policies change. So as uh, unpopular as the Bush administration is uh, abroad, I think that if I'm right in believing that uh, the next ad uh, American administration is going to act as a better citizen of the world than the present administration, then I think those poll numbers will change. But I think it's almost impossible to uh, camouflage the, uh, the policies in the administration. As, uh, you remember that uh, President Bush at the Republican Convention said, uh, some people say I walk with a swagger. In Texas, they just call that walking. And that's a real attitude on the part of the president. There's no doubt about it. He's not putting it on. Uh, and that's never going to go down well abroad. So uh, we'll have to see uh, whether uh, the trends, as I believe, uh, will push the next uh, American administration to a more collaborative approach in foreign policy than the present administration. Even there are signs even now that uh, the Bush administration feels the pressure for Condoleezza Rice to say without contradiction from either the president or the vice president that this is the time for diplomacy is a sign that uh, the administration recognizes that the cost of our military effort in Iraq is uh, overwhelming, that there have to be better alternatives. The question, of course, is whether this administration has the people and the sensitivity, the perception, to be able to make that change in a convincing way. I wouldn't expect more than, than adjustments in America. I think the appointment of John Bolton uh, to the United Nations is an indication uh, the tough approach is uh, still the favored approach at the White House. And of course, some of that uh, has been present in all administrations. Remember that when the Nixon administration was pulling out of Vietnam, the rationale expressed publicly was that we were backing out of the barroom shooting. And Henry Kissinger compared himself to the lone cowboy. This Western frontier metaphor is one that is deeply appealing to all administrations, whether Republican or Democratic. The danger is when they come to believe that this means that we can act alone, because our ability to act alone is far less than it was 50 years ago. Can you give a brief uh, summary of your career from your time as an undergraduate up to your time at, at the uh, National Defense University? I'm sorry, I didn't say the question. Yes. I think for the standpoint of undergraduates, what, uh, what always strikes me when I think of 
how I came into diplomacy was how unexpected it was. What I really wanted to do was to be a documentary filmmaker. And <laughs> I was, in fact, working in documentary films in New York immediately after I graduated from Columbia. And by happen chance, this was the time when the State Department, which ran our international public affairs, was recruiting motion picture officers. My boss recommended me to, to the uh, State Department. And I was hired as a motion picture officer. That's how I became an assistant attache in Ankara, uh, running mobile film units all over Turkey and eventually making films in Turkey. Uh, and in many ways, it was the best job that I ever had. I think some of today, some of the best foreign service officers I know began to, began in the Peace Corps. The closer you get to the, to the grassroots, the better uh, later on in your, in your career. Uh, but in any event, uh, as a motion picture officer, the, the then ambassador, the same man who wanted me to play bridge and golf with him when we were interned by the Soviets, took an interest in me and convinced, uh, convinced me to take the Foreign Service exam, so I did. I uh, came in the front door. My early, I tended to specialize in Eastern Mediterranean affairs, but really a lot of uh, Foreign Service work, as Ken knows full well, is the result of luck. Someone notices your work and asks for, asks for you in a place that you never expected to go, doing things you never expected to do. My wife and I were in London, happily serving in the embassy in London. I was doing uh, the Africa job in the political section when I received a telephone call asking me whether I'd like to go to Laos, half a world away. House. We went to Harvard for a fellowship year and then was brought down to Washington to, to serve as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Indochina. And then the colonels fell in Greece and were yanked back on short notice uh, to Athens. So that uh, the one strong piece of advice that I would, that I would give anyone considering a foreign service career is languages, languages, languages. To learn Greek uh, when I learned it was thought to be a waste of time. After all, you could only serve in Athens or Thessaloniki or Nicosia. That Greek is a hard language. But in the end, uh, our family returned to Greece three different times. Spent uh, 11 years there. It became almost a second home, and without the Greek language, that obviously would not have happened. So, uh, to be an effective diplomat, you need to be flexible and have a wide, and have wide peripheral vision. But you also need to know something specific that combination, even if the something specific like the Greek language sometimes seems to be a total waste of time. Yes.
American approach to foreign policy perhaps interrupted <coughs> by a couple decades in the post-war period where we did a little more engagement, um, and therefore likely to be longer lasting or, and or a product of, of, of the configuration of the international system as it currently is, and they're, therefore also likely to, to outlast yeah. the administration so that you can really depress us. Allowing <laughs> these further opportunities. No, that's an excellent question and an excellent point. And uh, it's, uh, it's absolutely true that what we see in the policies of the Bush administration are by, by no means uh, uniquely uh, Bushian policies. Uh, in World War I, uh, the Wilson administration refused to become a full military partner of the Entente. We were military collaborators, but we res res reserved our, our freedom of, uh, of uh, action, and in fact, toward the end, when we were trying to um, convince uh, our European partners or associates to uh, support a real League of Nations, uh, we threatened to sign a separate peace with, with the Germans so that uh, freedom of action was important, disengagement, apartness was important to the Wilson administration, and of course, as passionate an Anglophile as Franklin Roosevelt was, uh, he recognized the strength of the America First movement, and uh, we only went to war when the Japanese attacked us and the Germans declared war on us. So uh, a new election is not going to uh, change American foreign policy or our approach to uh, foreign policy immediately. But it has to start somewhere, and I do believe that uh, the ultimate effect of September 11 and the Twin Towers will be to make us realize that we are now vulnerable on our own soil and that it is not within our ability to secure our own defenses alone. This will take time and uh, to overcome this innate sense of American apartness, also known as isolationism, is by no means easy. But I'm nevertheless inclined to think that the extreme unilateralism, extreme nationalism of the current administration is a sign that we are aware that we're no longer able to act quite the way we used to. But the uh, mentality that you have outlined is one that isn't going to go, go away immediately. Well, the young, uh, we all know, uh, don't rely on their news uh, through reading newspapers. So while it's deplorable for members of an older generation to realize that the readership uh, per capita is falling for the New York Times and serious newspapers, there's an awful lot of information available on foreign affairs on the net. There are many, many other ways of uh, satisfying one's curiosity. I'm not sure that I think that uh, the American people as a whole are less interested in foreign affairs. It seems to me that uh, one effect of the Iraq war has been to make everyone aware of uh, long-standing problems in the Middle East. Uh, 
uh, the schools, of course, is where all of these processes have to begin. And um, the Dickey Center, for example, becomes a very important way to uh, bring students, uh, the whole younger generation, into an awareness of foreign affairs and how important foreign affairs is in our daily lives here in the United States. I think it's very unfortunate that American newspapers have closed foreign bureaus and to the extent they have. But uh, on the other hand, lots of Americans are able to go abroad and do go abroad. And um, you and I have uh, two sons living in Europe, married to a French, uh, French girl and a German girl. So I think that uh, there are ups and downs in this kind of interest, but uh, uh, I think that we'll see a revival, and they're perhaps already beginning. I hope so. specific ways of addressing the, the distance and relating to foreign affairs, those people who are more supportive of the current administration's policies, going to Libya, going to Lebanon, going to a whole variety of developments, including Israel leaving the Gaza Strip, as somehow linked to the aggressive foreign policy, which you're critical of. The second, I'd just like your comment what linkages uh, you see or don't see with uh, those events. And the second is, I'm always disturbed because I go to a lot of academic uh, groupings here and talking, I'm disturbed by the monolithic culture of protest against the person and the way it's frequently been personalized in terms of the current president. I'm a professional historian of the United States. I do think 9-11 was of immense importance in terms of shaping options in foreign policy. Modern technology obviously makes us exposed as we never were before. And I'd like your comments on how you see, you know, you're talking about old-fashioned negotiation as a solution. How do you see foreign policy actions should be and never will be changed because of 9-11. It's a two separate question. Well, I think you and I would uh, agree on the exceptional significance of what happened on 9-11 and its effect on, on the American people on a whole. Where we would disagree, I think, is, is what will flow from that. Because what I think will flow from that is a recognition that we need to wear, work more closely with other states, particularly with the European Union states. And uh, if I understand you correctly, you believe that uh, this reinforces the need for us to act decisively and alone. For individual cases that you cited, Libya, I think uh, we have to give a lot of credit to the British who were working on Libyans long before we began. And uh, most of the other problems that, uh, that we face, uh, we have a great deal that we can learn and share with other states who have been working on them together with us. So that I don't see the possibility of uh, a U.S. role being effective without effective allies, without our willing, willingness to... Uh, to give a little as well as get a little. But I recognize that the point of view that you have expressed is one that, after all, contributed to the re-election of President Bush, so we're obviously not alone. And uh, it is always tempting for Americans to believe that because we are large and because we 
are uh, protected by oceans or used to be protected by oceans. But allies tend to, to force us to make compromises that we don't have to make if we act alone. But my own view of the future is a different one as I expressed it. I think the ability of the United States or any other uh, state to change or affect significantly the internal structures, political and economic, of other countries is very limited. Uh, we had hoped in Vietnam that where we had, after all, uh, a working government and a standing army that uh, we could simply give them a reasonable interval to be able to stand on their own. We found that wasn't going to be enough. I'm pessimistic about our ability to create structures that, in Iraq that will enable us to withdraw soon, leave behind something that will last. So that I'm, I tend to be, as a former professional diplomat, skeptical about our ability to to uh, change the internal affairs of other states. I think in the case of Haiti, a peacekeeping, a limited peacekeeping role and a role which prevents large numbers of Haitians from seeking refuge in the United States is probably an absolute necessity. But I would be very pessimistic about the possibility to turn Haiti around. That's been tried for decades and hasn't worked so far. Of course, the whole question of whether better intelligence would have enabled us to uh, take steps to prevent what happened on September 11 is uh, a subject of hot debate. My own experience with intelligence is that uh, there is always uh, correct intelligence somewhere. And the difficulty is to decide what is correct and what is incorrect uh, and get it to policymakers in sufficient time. I think that uh, what I have read about the lead up to September 11 indicates to me that uh, people like Richard Clark, who uh, were, whose whole career and interest was in anti-terrorist activity, uh, were unable to convince policymakers that uh, this was an imminent problem. And I don't think this would have been true only of the Bush administration by any means. I don't think the Clinton administration necessarily would have been able to react uh, any differently. I'm not sure that I think that the Homeland Security Department is, is the right solution. It seems to me to add bureaucratic layering rather than remove it. What we've seen with uh, Hurricane Katrina is that uh, too much has been lumped into Homeland Security. That natural disasters are probably more likely to strike us than man-made disasters as time goes by. 
so that uh, I don't think there was a, uh, uh, there were no set of steps that we now see that could have been taken before September 11 that would have prevented this. We know that uh, we should have had a better fix on all of those uh, flight students who wanted to take off but not to land. But uh, that's wisdom after the fact. And who knows if we get a group equally intent on inflicting serious damage on the United States, whether they would take that uh, use that same method or some completely different one. So it's awfully hard to prepare in all respects. I think that uh, John Negroponte, our new number one uh, leader of intelligence, coordinator of intelligence, is a very good man. When I was ambassador, or when I was uh, number two in Athens, when John was consul general in Thessaloniki, and vouch for the fact that he's highly intelligent, very disciplined and energetic, and a principled conservative. And I think that uh, John will do as well as anyone and better than most in trying to improve the quality of, of our intelligence in the future, but I don't think that we're ever going to reach a point where we can be completely safe and secure. thing to do is uh, to engage your students as deeply as possible in the study of your own areas of expertise. And here, as I indicated before, I think that the study of history is being neglected. And I think we need, I've noticed in young foreign service officers uh, just entering the diplomatic service that uh, knowledge of history has uh, uh, deteriorated. Uh, the young foreign service officer is much more familiar with uh, various uh, political science theories than he is with the actual history of a given region or a given country. And therefore, I'm a great exponent of, of placing a little bit more stress on history before one moves on to trying to draw from history more general, more general lessons. I found when uh, I served in the Congo, and it was during the first time of troubles between 1963 and 65, that uh, because events were moving so quickly and because there was scarcely time to begin to appreciate the extraordinarily rich culture of the Congo, that uh, uh, 
someone like Crawford Young from the University of Wisconsin, who knew the Congo intimately, was able to come out and put in context events that were swirling past us practitioners at the embassy. And there will always be a role for uh, a scholar who knows, a scholar who has a context, the scholar who can look beyond the immediate flow of events. And uh, that's what we will continue to rely on you for. As far as uh, changes in style between administrations, I can compare the Bush administration with the Reagan administration. I was ambassador to Greece uh, under the Reagan administration, appointed by President Reagan, and uh, a socialist government was elected soon after our arrival in Greece. And uh, Andreas Papandreou, the Greek prime minister, was a strident critic of American foreign policy. And I found, uh, I saw President Reagan on several occasions, and I found that he was quite relaxed about this kind of thing. He was a man who had made his own living by communicating. And he tended to say, uh, well, you know, this guy Papandreou uh, has to get reelected. Uh, are our military bases still able to operate in Greece? And if you say, yes, Mr. President, well, let's forget about all of that talk. I think uh, the Bush administration is less tolerant of talk than the Reagan administration was, and I think Ronald Reagan was a less ideological leader than President Bush.